Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our talk where we want to talk about um, how to manage uh, security uh, for a Kubernetes cluster. So my name is Sebastian Schiele. I'm one of the co-founders of Lutze. We are a Hamburg-based startup and uh, working um, how to manage Kubernetes cluster at scale. Good morning, KubeCon. My name is uh, Simon Pierce, and uh, all a warm welcome to Barcelona, nice sunny city. Hope you're enjoying the uh, keynotes and everything. Um, one of the first talks is today. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today. And uh, basically, I'm from a company called Sys11, a web hosting company based in uh, Berlin in Germany. And uh, as Sebastian already said, we would like to talk to you uh, today about how we manage uh, security issues at Sys11 and how we run uh, Kubernetes clusters at scale. So let's get started. Is it working? Uh, Let's do it here. Uh, Where's the mouse? Sorry, one moment. OK. So first, first of all, why are we doing all this? It's basically, I want to take you on a journey here, tell us a bit about our story, about what we're trying to achieve uh, here. So uh, first of all, it's definitely important to know why are we actually doing this. We're doing this because we're basically a service provider, so we offer Kubernetes as a service to a lot of customers with various different use cases. Um, we basically have uh, run multiple clusters, and they're also distributed between uh, OpenStack, and also we run them on AWS too. So customers have got the freedom of choice to choose between these two platforms that they would like to use, and basically use them uh, as efficiently as possible. Different platforms, different features. The majority of these clusters are managed clusters. In all cases, we definitely take the full management and responsibility of all the master components that we run in the Kubernetes cluster, because we feel that the majority of, of the customers do not want to take care of, uh, is my ETCD running? Uh, how is my API server doing? What is my controller manager doing? The major interest of all of our customers is running containerized applications at scale. 24-7 support is also a crucial uh, key within uh, our ecosystem. Having engineers that need to be able to get paged at 3 in the morning, maybe, to find out as quickly as possible what's going on, what's going wrong with this cluster, and how can we fix it as quickly as possible. Greatly coupled on that is often a service level agreement. So we basically um, guarantee people that their API endpoints are going to be accessible, that they're able to deploy um, uh, a new uh, deployments, that they're able to run stuff on their cluster, and uh, everything runs efficiently as possible. And another one which is a great challenge to us is that all of our uh, K8S API endpoints are public available. Because we have people all around the globe, people, home workers, people working from their offices, it's really difficult to, to put a VPN or any form of firewall in front of it. So basically, all of these clusters are public available, and this is definitely or can cause issues. So what is our motivation? Why are we actually uh, trying to do this? What is basically uh, what we're trying to achieve here? One is to be one of the best managed Kubernetes services in Germany, at least, maybe. Which is, is kind of uh, looking at, at something which is uh, quite difficult to become, but not impossible, I would say. Also, a great motivation is having to deal and fix security issues. So basically, um, have check what security issues are there, and how can I deal with them, and, and what do I actually have to do? Um, yeah, um, I mean, before going into security issues, um, the first, first question for me into the round is, like, um, raise your hands, how many people run at least one cluster uh, in production? Who are running five clusters in production? Who are running 20 clusters in production? Yeah, less hands. We're running 50. 
So there are currently only a few, but like imagine you want to run a lot of clusters, 50, 100, thousands of clusters in production, especially like a service provider, or what we also see, more and more uh, enterprise companies uh, want to run hybrid cloud, multi-cloud environments. And uh, now you get the challenge, there are new bugs are coming out, like uh, the 1C bug, uh, which occurs uh, this year, where uh, attackers can override the binary and can root access to your, to your node. Or like um, last December, um, the Kubernetes uh, bug, which was the problem that um, you could um, get, um, um, you could escalate your, uh, your calls so that you can complete access to the API uh, when you're running an API, an aggregated, aggregated API server. And like in the default setup, um, on most Kubernetes systems, the metric server was running there, so this was the case. And so, um, especially if your Kubernetes API server is publicly exposed, you must act quite fast. And as Simon said, um, um, the node, uh, for example, at this 11, they don't must be on a public net, but, but somehow the masters are on a, a public network. So you must act fast. And, it's much more important, first of all, you need to know which systems you are patching, uh, because when you know, okay, there are potentially 50 systems in, the, uh, in your organization, uh, are you sure which version they are running? So to really have a centralized view on it, to know, okay, uh, these clusters are affected, these clusters I need to patch, and um, how to do this. So next is basically the challenge. What uh, challenges are we facing here? And I would like to talk to you a bit about uh, what kind of challenges you have when you're running uh, multiple hundreds of Kubernetes clusters. So basically, we're running hundreds of clusters across different cloud providers for a vast amount of customers. And a, a large majority of these customers also run production workloads. We're not just talking about testing, dev, staging stuff. We're actually talking about production workloads. These are distributed, as I said earlier, across multiple clouds, which also gives us more issues that we need to face and encounter, because uh, the way you may have to roll out stuff, the things you may need to change, things like base images, network configurations, are different across different cloud providers, as the majority of you probably already know. So how, how do you actually deal with these type of security issues? And uh, what do you have to do to actually um, find out where they are and uh, see what, what, what actions need, need to be taken? So number one would be like, how do you go about upgrading production clusters? So you've got like workload on there and uh, you somehow you need to shift this workload from maybe one cluster to another or onto another worker nodes. There's lots of stuff that you need to think about and to consider when uh, making these de decisions. And one of the major problems is also that this, in the majority of times, needs to be done as soon as possible, depending on the uh, case. So how do we actually do this? Oh, sorry. So um, I mean, if you're running more than 20 clusters, 50 clusters, you cannot do this manually. Uh, you need to auto automate this. Um, so one possibility is to build an operator for Kubernetes, which manage your Kubernetes cluster, um, so that you can really leverage all the uh, functions Kubernetes provides you to upgrade and to um, uh, run across your whole infrastructure to upgrade the clusters and the nodes. So, and, and how can you do this? Like, one building block you could currently look like it's quite early. Um, it's currently still alpha, and there's a lot of discussion around. But you can at least get ideas if you want to build something like this. Is a cluster API, which is a part of the SIG life cycle group, where the intention is building building blocks for, for different use cases, like how to spin up a control plane up, how to manage my, my worker nodes, how to upgrade my worker nodes, and things like this. So, so really looking into how can I really automate all my cluster setup 
so that I then be able to build, some, build something on top of it, which can manage not even one cluster, which can manage 50, 100, thousands of clusters in a scalable way. And in best case, you can build it in a, that way that you can run it not only on one cloud, you can run it on multiple clouds, you can run it even on-prem, and have for your whole organization a single view of glass, how to manage this and how to control this. So, of course, one of the first parts is cluster creation and cluster updates. So uh, before you can manage anything or can manage a cluster, you need to upgrade uh, uh, the cluster or the create the cluster. Uh, and then later also have the possibility to upgrade uh, the cluster and somehow have a centralized registry where you can register all your clusters which are running in your organization so that you're not running in the problem, okay, a few developers set up a cluster there, and some other developers set up a cluster there, and from a security perspective, you don't even know what version of Kubernetes uh, you're running, what version of uh, operating system, container runtime you're running, and so if, if a bug uh, is coming up, you start searching in your organization, um, what clusters do I need to upgrade, um, or inform your developer and, and hope that your developer upgrade all the cluster and don't forget some small development cluster somewhere in the back, uh, uh, which is then affected potentially. Um, that's one point. Um, another point is also um, the cluster configuration and the cluster uh, management. So like not only the, the Kubernetes master, all components which you deploy on a master, you, you need to look into it. Like uh, if you're using an overlay network um, or a metric server, um, um, uh, Fluent D or a log shipper, things like this. So um, first of all, you need an overview there and also have control about this so that you can also upgrade this additional add-ons which are running on top of the cluster which are part of your main infrastructure. Um, so um, there's also the challenge to deploy this, manage this, and control this. And last but not least, um, your machines itself. So the worker nodes and the nodes of the, um, the master. Uh, and in best case, um, yeah, you want to control uh, the Kubernetes version, um, the Docker version, and all kinds of stuff. And um, one thing which is currently developed in the cluster API, for example, is a machine uh, deployment object, uh, which you then can use to do rolling upgrades of your machines so that you can upgrade um, the machines automatically um, without a lot of interactions. Yeah, and uh, what we do uh, to make this even easier, uh, together with this 11, we run Kubernetes uh, uh, on Kubernetes. So. Uh, um, because we said, okay, we don't want to, for every cluster, want to have the overhead of running a complete master um, with, with VMs. So we put the complete master uh, in container and run only the container overhead. This makes it already easier because we don't care for the master on the operating system layer. We, we only must upgrade um, the Kubernetes binaries and uh, the Docker images, but not like an additional operat uh, operation layer. And this makes it also easier for us um, because we can easily um, yeah, use Kubernetes principles uh, to manage a cluster. So one of the takeaways here was definitely see your Kubernetes cluster as a Kubernetes resource. In the majority of the time, you see people trying to uh, pull up clusters uh, with maybe uh, building infrastructure with Terraform, running some form of configuration management on top of that. If you see basically your cluster resources and your nodes as a Kubernetes resource, then you can basically use the abilities that Kubernetes already has the ability to use a scheduler, the ability to use deployments for your machines, as you saw just a minute ago on the example YAML that we had, which then allows you to basically do rolling upgrades instead of uh, having to rebuild all your machines and do other things with them. And one of the key points uh, that we need to look at here, of course, for us offering a managed service is monitoring. How can we actually monitor, find out what are people running in their clusters? And one specific thing is what version of Kubernetes are they running? Are they actually running a version which is vulnerable, which could cause us problems? And in this uh, Grafana graph, you can basically see at the time and at that moment that what version people were running. And towards the end, people were kind of switching to 114, partly to do with that we were running upgrades for people and partly because people saw we were actually offering a 
new version on our dashboard, and it's basically a point to click install to get to the next version. And that's what it should be like. It shouldn't be like, okay, is this going to work? Uh, what am I going to have to do? I mean, to rethink this, I mean, Kubernetes is a fast moving piece of software, so there's going to be a lot of updates to be done. It's something you need to consider when you're running these sort of systems in production. So, um, how do we actually do this? We can basically patch the cluster object. We have a cluster object which uh, basically defines. Um, the API servers, uh, the Kubernetes version we would like to run, and all those sort of things. And we can use a standardized uh, kubectl patch method to actually patch these resources and uh, provide each customer individually with an upgrade. So it's also possible to do uh, canary upgrades and other things to actually find out if we are going to run into any potential issues while doing this. And then we basically come to the upgrade process as in such. What do we have to do to actually accomplish this? So first, of course, when we're talking about security issues, we need to know what is affected and who is affected. So often this is done if you, if you find out what, how severe is the impact going to be. So if we're talking about something public facing like the API server, for instance, and if we look back at one of the bugs which Sebastian showed us, where you could basically use an anonymous request, you could basically use the API server to proxy request through to the metrics endpoint and to other things, this can be very severe. So then we're talking probably that hundreds of customers are going to be affected by this. So we're going to have to react fairly quickly. One of the instruments and one of the tools that we've introduced at Sys11 to um, overcome these sort of situations is a so-called change advisory board. So we have like a, a group of uh, Kubernetes engineers, uh, some security engineers, they're all on the board. Most of these, uh, all these people, of course, uh, have a great idea about how Kubernetes runs, which moving parts we're talking about, and how severe this issue is. We basically are always uh, reading the mailing list, checking out what kind of uh, issues um, arise on GitHub. Uh, our partner Lutz here are great help doing that, of course, because they do a lot of engineering within the Kubernetes ecosystem. So automatically you find out about these sort of things, hopefully a bit quicker than the general public. So we can basically kind of address these issues. Then we've got a notifying system so we can find out what uh, version, as we saw on the Grafana dashboard, are people actually running? And then we can basically, um, through our notifier, we can inform these people individually and tell them, okay, your system is affected, we have a problem here, and if it is an urgent, severe issue, then we are going to fix this issue today. We're not going to wait another day, we're going to start off, and we're definitely going to patch your API server and make sure it is in a good state again. Then we go and we start patching all or the majority. Normally it's like that we do it for one region first and then we would go to another region. Maybe we can uh, pick certain customers that might be more vulnerable than others and definitely look at the targeted versions that we're looking at. Oops. Then we would often start out by maybe rolling out a new base image into our uh, cloud, which would uh, definitely uh, help us get all the security patches out, maybe also why we're doing it anyway, might as well run a new kernel as well. And there's also other things that we need uh, to maybe look at afterwards. Then we can go and upgrade the machine deployments. We now have the new base image. We can switch the current machine deployment, which is basically a rolling upgrade. So similar to you would do when you, you're deploying uh, your application, we can do exactly the same for all of our worker nodes. We basically tell Kubernetes, okay, there's a new version of this image available. There's a new version of Kubernetes available. We have exactly the same uh, max unavailable, max search um, um, configuration possibilities available to dynamically upgrade the nodes and also drain the nodes at the same time so that we basically shift the container workload from one node to another, one by one, to make sure none of the customers are affected during that time. We don't want any of the customers to have any outages while we're doing this. So rolling upgrade, of course, uh, as a, a Kubernetes feature, is one of the uh, key components to be able to do this. 
Here we definitely need to look at upgrading the Docker daemon if we're looking at uh, some of the uh, issues we were talking about earlier. The Docker daemon uh, was in a, a state where if people were running uh, containers with a UID zero, so as a root, which I'm afraid a lot of people still do, then uh, it was possible to break out of the uh, actual container and to obtain root access uh, on the host system, which of course uh, is definitely a no-go. So it's definitely also something that needs to be addressed fairly quickly. Also, the kubelet, which is running on every worker node, should also be part of the upgrade procedure. We've also seen quite a few issues with kubelets as well. So the next would be our best practices, which we would like to talk about. Yeah, um, I mean, um, what we learned uh, during the last uh, two to three years. Um, um, first of all, what really helps us is um, automate all your upgrade processes. So especially if you are over 20 systems, clusters, you don't want to do this manually anymore. You need to do automation um, and uh, everything should be built up for this so that you easily can deploy new versions without any manual uh, intervention. Um, so that you know, first of all, you know that your process is running and that really no one needs to interact when you know, okay, I need to upgrade all my clusters now. Um, uh, that it's only like you're putting somewhere a version and then the control plane starts and um, doing this. Another important stuff is um, what we learned is like we're doing a lot of e 2 e tests uh, on all supported cloud providers. So um, what you see on this slide, it's a small screenshot from our um, CI system. So technically what we're doing on the one side to have stability in our system, but what really helps us also to check if new versions are running um, and uh, don't create a regression. Um, we have complete E2E tests uh, on all the different cloud providers um, uh, we support. And um, on, on, on Kubernetes or on Lutz's side, we, we support like all the majors, AWS, Azure, um, uh, Google, but also OpenStack, VMware, and many more. Um, and so we really want to uh, need to ensure uh, when there's a new version, uh, we can roll this out and uh, it's not breaking. Um, so the only thing what we currently uh, only need to do now is like we're putting the new version into our um, CI system in our version file, and then the, um, our test suite starts running and uh, test first of all, can we spin up a cluster? Um, but also things like, can we upgrade? Uh, can we upgrade from one version to the next version? Um, and um, like after uh, two, three hours, we know, okay, yeah, the new versions are running uh, with all the different combinations. Um, also with different potentially combinations of the uh, operating system. So, uh, and then we, we know, okay, yeah, now we can ship this to our customers and um, they can bring this uh, into production. Um, the next thing is, um, if you're doing this automated, uh, running your uh, um, CI system testing if the versions are running, running the conformance tests so that you every time know, okay, there's nothing breaking. But the conformance tests are not enough. Look into what additional things you need, like um, uh, the conformance tests don't cover your storage and don't cover your load balancer. So putting tests, additional tests around this, um, but that at the end you know, okay, I can, I'm not even able to spin up a cluster. I'm not only able to spin up uh, or upgrade a cluster. I know all the functionalities Kubernetes uh, provides, like deployment, stateful sets, uh, and so on, are still working. And um, so then you know, okay, um, everything is working and you can bring uh, the new version um, into production. Um, what's currently um, uh, quite new um, and which makes sense to look into um, are pod security policies so that you can uh, enforce um, the users to potentially not running specific things. For example, uh, that the um, container is running not as a, a root user. So that would already prevent you uh, from the um, run C, CVE uh, VSAR. And when you have this activated, um, there's one thing less 
um, of course, you should upgrade still uh, and patch this, but it's not, you don't have this urgency in your uh, system that you say, okay, now it's really urgent. Uh, as Simon said, I need to do this as soon as possible um, uh, in the day where it's coming out. Uh, then you have a few days more to test this and um, figure out um, if there's potential uh, a risk. Um, another thing is, uh, admission controllers, especially if you're providing managed Kubernetes to your uh, organizations. So potentially you want to prevent um, the developers to do specific things or um, uh, have more control uh, what you do in the Kubernetes uh, API. Yeah, and then um, there's the CSI benchmark, which describes um, um, security perspectives for Kubernetes. And there's also some tools available, um, like, uh, for example, Kubebench, which you can run on your cluster and which gives you at least some indications um, where things could be, where you should look into it. And then you can dedicate it, look into it, and decide, okay, if this is critical for my cluster, or you say, no, I know this point, but it's not not critical for me, or I, can, uh, I need this and uh, I don't want to uh, or cannot fix this. Yeah, and the last thing is, uh, you need to be get informed about uh, new uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, sec security problems. So um, there's, you can join a list uh, where there are the uh, Kubernetes announcements, and there you get an email also about security issues. Uh, of course, uh, also uh, you can uh, get this information uh, from Twitter or in the Slack uh, from the Kubernetes uh, community, but you should be watching this actively and know, okay, uh, when something comes out, you get be informed. Uh, because that's the first point, you need to be informed that uh, you need to upgrade before you can take any actions. Yeah, so I think, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think the most important thing about here for, the, for this, for you to take away, is that security should be a concept in your company, no matter if you're running one or multiple Kubernetes clusters. Do your fire drills, be prepared, security, issues are going to arise and they're going to be more to come in the future and most probably they're going to get worse. So definitely be prepared. So thank you very much for listening. Does anyone have any questions? We also have some swag here to give away. So any questions? Anything you're interested in? Yep. Thank you. At the start of your presentation you mentioned that you uh, managing clusters on AWS. So my question is, what's the key advantage of your service over uh, managed Kubernetes service of Amazon, for example, or any other provider? Yep, great question. Of course, it would be uh, fairly simple to basically uh, adapt something like EKS and, and use it. That was not our intention when we decided to go out and build a service. We have uh, a vast amount of software engineers on our teams. We wanted to make Kubernetes feel in a way that it was, it was built by us, that it had like the uh, additional add-ons that we wanted. We include like uh, backups. We got a federated Prometheus included. Of course, we could have done some of that work on uh, EKS, but it kind of makes sense to run our own clusters. And also, the way that we're running Kubernetes in Kubernetes is slightly different to the way that most of the other managed providers uh, offer their product. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm very interested in the way you do cluster upgrades and uh, how you honor the, any SLA with the user, especially if users set things like a pod disruption budget that sometimes not even set correctly. Um, what is your policy and how is it communicated before, for instance, removing pods that should not be removed, let's say it that way. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, so you're, you're definitely right. We encountered a few issues uh, doing this. Um, number one is like run all your mask components in pods. 
which uh, helps us a lot. We can run like easily two replicas of things like API servers. So it's like fairly simple to uh, actually uh, get a service which is not interruptible. There are definitely, and one of the things that you definitely mentioned, pod, uh, disruption policies can cause problems. We run ETCD, for instance, as stateful sets for our customers. And uh, if uh, um, a number of worker nodes are giving you problems or you have any network outages, then definitely things like pod uh, disruption po uh, policies can cause problems, especially if they're wrongly configured. So at the end, it all boils down to monitoring and uh, good engineers and know what they're doing. I mean, you've got to consistently look at these uh, services. You've got to uh, find out what uh, kind of reaction times of my customers have, what kind of experience they have. And also our company ourselves, we also work with the product. So all of our own applications are also hosted um, on our managed Kubernetes. So uh, basically people notice it fairly quickly if uh, something is not running or performing as it should do. Thanks for your talk, first of all. Um, regarding pod security policies, how did you go about enforcing, for example, um, that a container shouldn't be running as a root user inside of the container on your customers that have already built containers that are doing it? Um, I mean, there are different, different options. On the one side, I mean, doing the cluster creation, um, um, we can decide, okay, or the developer can decide if, if he wants to have um, port security policies. But on the other side, it's also a question how you shape your service. So if you say, okay, my service, uh, we want to provide you the best experience in the world um, and um, to vo avoid outages, or your expectation is for, uh, a complete managed Kubernetes, uh, this is the minimum requirement uh, you need to provide. And uh, if um, this is not available, uh, or if, if you build the application not in that way, it cannot run in, um, in the cluster. And this is why we're, for example, looking heavily into admission controllers so that we can detect before deployment um, that potentially this application should not run there because we know, okay, it could get, uh, cause problems and uh, inform the user early at the beginning and potentially not ever st uh, even start the uh, application because then he see, okay, something is not right with my, uh, my application um, and not like, okay, let the application run and then it goes somehow into trouble and you don't know uh, w w what's going on. So block this as early as possible. But it's, it's every time like, okay, how much service you want to provide as a managed service so, and how much flexibility to provide uh, the end users. Um, on, the, on the one side is we want to automate everything. So when, when we have a developer who says, no, I, I know what I'm doing, he should have the tool stack to deploy his cluster on its own, but then it's his, his responsibility. When he says, no, I don't want to be responsible for all the things, do a complete automatic setup, uh, then we put the layer higher and say, okay, but then we will force you to not uh, do those things because otherwise we cannot guarantee. If you're taking full responsibility for all these clusters, then you definitely need to enforce certain mechanisms. Otherwise, you're going to run into severe problems sooner or later. And definitely, one of them is definitely uh, build, running Docker in Docker, for instance, and uh, running containers as UID zero. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, would you mention anything specific when it comes to upgrading clusters with 50 plus nodes? Or could be 100 nodes. Is there anything specific uh, uh, comparing to smaller clusters? Yes. What one must keep in mind? Um, there's definitely a few things to keep in mind when you're running like 50 plus worker nodes on your cluster because basically you're talking about probably shifting a lot of persistent volumes and a lot of parts from A to B. So um, probably one of the things is uh, what you could do is like uh, put them into individual machine sets. So we, you could use individual machine deployments and say put like bunches of 20 nodes uh, running certain specific versions and then you'd only have to deal with those at that point of time. And then you could do another 20, maybe a few hours later or the next day. And the more that process is automated, uh, the, more, the, the easier it is to get that achieved as well. Because a lot of these processes can basically run overnight, where a lot of our customers don't do all that much work on their clusters, or not so much as they would during, as during the daytime. The impact is not quite as great. But I would definitely say like, uh, distributing smaller sets of machines is definitely the way that you really want to get around that, if it's possible. And that's where uh, definitely using work, seeing worker nodes and clusters as an API object is definitely helps doing that. Okay, I think we are at the end of our time. 
So. That's a long way. You have to help me, guys. Okay. Who's the first one showing up a green envelope? Is there anyone with a green envelope? No one? So first a question. Um, I want to ask uh, if the vulnerability that we have is outside the clustering group. So for example, of, uh, if the nodes, I mean, on the level of the nodes or operating system, we have uh, vulnerabilities. So what is the most uh, acceptable policy is to start to migrate the, the current cluster to another infrastructure or to repair the infrastructure itself? Assume that uh, the all nodes in the infrastructure have the same, has the same vulnerability. So basically, you would like to migrate all of your uh, workloads to a different provider, do I understand that correctly, to a different cloud, or? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, suppose we have 10 nodes that, uh, in, the, in this 10 nodes, they have uh, our master uh, and workers. And these two nodes suppose that it's the same operating system, same infrastructure uh, specification. And we discover zero days vulnerability in level of infrastructure on level on the operating system, I mean outside the cluster. So how we can manage to uh, resolve the security issues outside cluster groups yes. uh, is the best way to start managing and keep the cluster itself with the same node and start to solve it node by node or to migrate it to another nodes more secure, I mean, to start on level to secure a, a new node and book a new node and to migrate to, to new node or to start remaining the node itself. What is a much yeah, more? I, I, think, I, I think we can, uh, we will discuss this afterwards. So uh, I think we are end of time. So thank you all. Um, if you have further questions, I mean, we are still here uh, and can answer your question, otherwise, um, this 11 has a booth uh, at the conference, and we also have a booth, Lutze, look at this logo, um, and there you can f ask all your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.